Congressman LaTourette, thanks for joining us this week. Yep. So a busy week here in D.C. Uh, let's get started with things. Transportation, what's happening? Well, actually, next week is going to be Transportation Week on the Hill, and so a lot of stakeholders are coming to Washington to talk to their members of Congress and senators about the issue of transportation. Uh, this week, however, we saw the uh, Transportation and uh, HUD uh, Appropriations Bill move out of subcommittee and, and move forward, which is a positive sign. Uh, they also began having some positive discussions on uh, the highway bill. And over in the Senate, Senator Boxer was going to roll out uh, her version of the six-year highway bill, which, as we've talked before, is great news, except, you know, she doesn't have any idea how to pay for it, but still it lays out uh, a number of the markers and, and some of the policy. And uh, the uh, House and the Senate are very close to wrapping up work on the uh, the water bill that's been in conference for a very long time. So uh, specifically on the, the highway bill, do you think that we're going to actually have one of these bipartisan moments here? Do you think that, that, that we're going to have a way for both parties and both chambers to work together to get something done on this? No. <laughs> no. no, but I, I mean, the, the, and we're not here, guys. Yeah, no. the, the, the good news is that, that they're at least uh, moving forward and talking about it and laying the foundation. The the problem is that there's precious little time, and by that I mean, so we're in the month of May. In May, the House is only in session for 12 days, uh, and then you get into the July 4th recess. Then you get into August. Then you get into the campaign. Uh, and so to actually have the time available to come up with thoughtful policy and a long-term bill and work out the not only the intra-party problems but the inter-party problems, it, it really it can't be done. And so what you are looking at is an extension, and the question will be whether that extension takes you to just pass the election in November so that it's dealt with in the lame duck or whether it will go into, uh, into January. But but, but I'll tell you, something has to be done because everybody says that the Highway Trust Fund is going broke uh, in August at the latest, and, and that would have catastrophic, catastrophic uh, effects upon, obviously, the road and bridge program all across the country, but employment and a whole host of other things would, would suffer in the states as well. Well, one of the things you mentioned that also got underway this week is the appropriations process. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about that. Well, you know, when uh, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, chairman of the Budget Committee, and, and uh, Senator Murray got together, uh, as the uh, chairman of the Budget Committee over in the Senate, and came up with the Ryan-Murray budget, it, it was unique in that it was a two-year budget as opposed to a one-year budget. And so even though the House produced its own budget this year, the numbers that they are using to uh, prepare the spending bills, the appropriations bills, are based upon that Ryan-Murray budget. Uh, and that's really given them the chance to jumpstart some of these things. So as I mentioned, you have the transportation HUD bill uh, moving forward, and you have concurrently uh, a number of uh, appropriations bills going into the pipeline. And at least if you know, if you listen to the, the chairman of the full committee, Hal Rogers of Kentucky, he thinks he'll have all of the bills on the floor in regular order and, and actually pass them and get them over to the Senate. The Senate's working in a similar track. Uh, and and I, I will tell you that uh, I, I was with the, this morning a, a guy who was the architect of the 1974 Budget Act under which all this stuff was predicated, and he told me that only three times since 1974 have they actually gotten to the point where all the bills have been on the floor and, and the work's been completed. So it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not something that happens on a regular basis, but again, I think it's at least encouraging. And, and unlike the answer I gave in your transportation question, there is some good bipartisan work going on in most of the, the spending bills. Uh, the one that's always a problem and probably divides the party the most is the Labor, Health, and Human Services bill that, that basically takes care of all the social safety net programs and education and so forth and so on. Uh, it's the biggest uh, of the appropriations bills except for defense. Uh, and it, it's the one that really divides the parties. But, but there are positive signs, and, and if they can go to full committee markup, and the date that I saw for transportation was May the 17th, <laughs> if they can go to full committee markup by May the 17th on, on some of these bills, that, that's a big step forward. Well, and, and here's a question. Have we learned a lesson from the, the two-year deal that was reached, the Ryan Murray budget deal? I mean, obviously, the appropriations process, this is the smoothest I think I can remember in my lifetime that people have been talking about how it's going to work. It's the most optimistic, especially considering how dysfunctional right. D.C. has been. 
Do you think that we've learned something from that from that deal that can or will be replicated moving forward? Well, there's been a movement for a number of years to go to a two-year budget cycle uh, because it just takes the pressure off. and So you have one hard year and then you have one year where everything's sort of on autopilot when it comes to what the top line numbers are. The other proposal that's sort of kicking around out there is, is that you know the, the government's fiscal year used to end on July the 1st. And, and what they found was, uh, and this goes back to the, the Budget Act of 1974, that with given you know the divergent folks and everybody's busy and running elections that nothing was getting done on time and so that's when they moved it to October the first there, there is a move afoot uh, in addition to the two-year budget to say you know what we should really make it January like 15th or something uh, because that way you can get through the election uh, you can have a lame duck where a lot of good work can happen uh, and then you have the beginning of the new Congress to sort of give give the members of Congress the opportunity to actually complete their tasks. And so you're not winding up with these omnibus bills, which are really a disaster uh, because, you know, if, if you're a, a very conservative member and you don't like spending, a lot of spending gets packed in there. Uh, if you're a progressive member and you don't like some government policy, a lot of policy gets stuck in there. Because, again, these page, these bills will be 3,000 pages long. And the only vote that a member has is yes or no. And you have to figure out if the, the stuff that bothers you bothers you so much that you want to shut down the government. Well, you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons why we may not see things happen as smoothly uh, on the transportation side is because we're entering the election season. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about we had, we had primary elections this week in Indiana, Ohio, and North Carolina. Talk to us a little bit about what happened. Well, the, the trend, at least on the Republican side, seems to be continuing where uh, the, the history of, of the Tea Party and their successes uh, to this moment in time has been to go into off-year elections where there's a low turnout uh, and, you know, energize a segment of the Republican base to select their nominee as the nominee of the Republican Party. Uh, what's changed going into this cycle is that, one, they're not catching people by surprise anymore. Uh, two, that uh, people are investing resources to sort of level the playing field and, and fight back. And as a result, in, in uh, Indiana, North Carolina, and also Ohio, uh, last night, the, the, there was not a Tea Party challenger who uh, unseated or defeated or displaced a, uh, a sitting member of Congress, and that's a big change. And, and, and with each day, you know, more primaries are taking place. The next big ones are May the 13th and then May the 20th. And there's going to come a time when, when this has sort of become a, a self-fulfilling prophecy where, uh, you know, already the media wants to write that this is the death of the Tea Party. I don't, I don't believe that. But what I do believe is that uh, the establishment Republican Party or the whatever you want to call us has, has sort of perked up and said, we have to be all about maintaining the majority in the House. We have to be all about capturing the majority in the Senate. And if you're a Republican, electing a Republican president in, in 2016 uh, and, and stop this internal business going on. And to this moment in time, it, it seems to be working. The, the other thing that uh, my favorite thing about this election cycle is that if you remember Claire McCaskill uh, in the, the race against Todd Aiken in Missouri, uh, she was everybody thought she was a goner. Uh, and she dumped about $2 million into uh, the primary, even though she didn't have a primary, propping uh, Congressman Aiken up as the most conservative guy and this, that, and the other thing. That actually catapulted him to the Republican nomination, and then she slaughtered him in the fall. Uh, you saw that recently down in North Carolina, where, where uh, Senator Kay Hagan took out advertising and, and said that the Speaker of the House down there uh, Tillis was, you know, he, he wasn't the real deal, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, he, he really wasn't against Obamacare, which Republicans don't want to hear that from a Republican nominee. Uh, and the same thing happened in, in my old seat where the, the, the fellow, the Democrat, Mr. Wager, went in and bought some TV on Fox News to say that, you know, the Tea Party guy was, was the true conservative. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic that, that you know, and, and reinforces in my mind why this view is we have to sort of even things out here is that if the Democrats have figured out who they'd rather run against, that's not, that's not good for us. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us this week. Okay.